What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the Hydrogeology Playlist. This is episode 7 and we're going to be covering the principles of groundwater flow. And this picture on this slide represents the type of math that we are avoiding on this channel. Um, it's supposed to be streamlined for people studying for the FG. But uh, this gives you a, kind of an example of the type of math that can be exposed during uh, hydrogeology. Okay, so groundwater energy. So groundwater possesses mechanical, thermal, and chemical energy. It is forced to move due to energy differentials, such as a difference in pressure or a difference in temperature. Um, so for this particular aspect of hydrogeology, you would want to know physics and thermodynamics, which I was requir required to take a course, actually multiple physics courses related to this. Um, so the three outside forces acting on groundwater are gravity, external pressure, and molecular attraction. Uh, gravity pulls the water down. Atmospheric pressure plus the overlying water creates pressure in the saturated zone, which is your external pressure. And uh, water adheres to solid surfaces, creates surface tension when exposed to air, such as we... such as the uh, capillary fringe that we talked about a few episodes ago, um, capillarity. And uh, shear stress and normal stress resist movement, which creates friction, which it creates viscosity. And viscosity, if you remember, is the resistance to flow of a fluid. So the hydraulic head. Uh, piezometers, which you can see on the right, uh, measure the total energy of the fluid moving through a pipe packed with sand. And to figure out hydraulic head, you find the elevation head, you add it to the uh, pressure head, that'll give you your total hydraulic head. And the way I calculate it professionally is you take the elevation uh, datum that you have from a surveyor, for instance, and you subtract the uh, the the level of groundwater, the the water table measurement you subtract the elevation from that and that'll give you your hydraulic head as well um, so the smaller the openings through which fluid moves the greater the friction groundwater warms it as it flows and mechanical energy that makes the water flow is converted to thermal energy so pipes oh i uh Apparently, uh, I uh, doubled the slide, but this kind of shows you, uh, this is a better diagram of the hydraulic head. You got the pressure head, the elevation head. Added Those two added together create your hydraulic head. And when you take your water level, obviously the triangle is the water table. Um, and if you know the elevation of this PVC pipe, um, you can figure out hydraulic head that way too by subtracting the elevation from the... Uh, the hydraulic head I mean the water table level measurement so Darcy's law and this is review in terms of the formula Q which is uh, the discharge equals negative K which is uh, hydraulic conductivity a is the cross-sectional area DH over DL or hydraulic gradient which is the change in head over the change in length and uh, you have laminar flow versus turbulent flow. So laminar is low energy flow where molecules follow streamlines, as you can see in this picture right here. And as the velocity of the flow increases, it gains kinetic energy. Inertial for forces more influential than uh, the viscous forces. Uh, fluid particles become erratic and streamlines do not exist anymore, as you can see in this, in this photo. And there's a reason why we're talking about this. So the Reynolds number, it did, and this is kind of review if you uh, took sedimentology, we, you learn about Reynolds number. I think it's also in geotechnical textbooks as well. But the Reynolds number determines whether a flow is laminar or turbulent. And it, the formula is R equals fluid density times discharge velocity times the diameter of the passageway divided by the viscosity and fluid density is in meter, uh, measurement divided by length cubed, length times time for discharge velocity, such as meters per second, 
diameter of the passageway, so an inch or a millimeter. And then viscosity is uh, a measurement divided by uh, time times length. So kilograms divided by the seconds times meters. <clears throat> so if the Reynolds number is over 2,000, it's turbulent. Um, and then if it's less than 2,000, it's laminar. And, well, actually, it, it's valid... It's valid when the Reynolds number is uh, between 1 and 10, I guess, technically. Because uh, groundwater does not move that fast in the ground. Um, typically, when you're using Reynolds number, you're also talking about stream flows, which can be very high, very turbulent. Uh, in terms of water moving inside the ground, it's moving at very low rates, which is why uh, Reynolds number between 1 and 10 makes Darcy's Law valid. So, uh, flow lines and flow nets, as you can see in this picture. Uh, a flow line is an imaginary line that traces the path of a particle of groundwater. Uh, the path that a particle would flow uh, would follow as it flows through an aquifer. It's helpful for visualizing flow through aquifer. In isotropic aquifer, flow lines will cross equipotential lines. And anisotropy, uh, cross they, the... Equipotential lines will be crossed at an angle dictated by the degree of anisotropy and the orientation of the gradient. So th this looks like it's isotropic, this aquifer, based on, based on this. But if it's not perpendicular, the flow lines and the equipotential lines... They call it streamlines in this diagram, but they're not uh, perpendicular. It's most likely because of anisotropy. So a flow net is basically the culmination of uh, equipotential lines, which are just groundwater contours, really, and the associated uh, flow lines. There are assumptions made when doing a flow net, so you, you assume that the aquifer is homogeneous, it's fully saturated, it's isotropic, and these are review terms, but homogeneous basically means the same material throughout. Isotropic means that uh, groundwater flow is equal in all directions in terms of velocities, um, in terms of per permeability, as I should say. Um, the vertical and uh, horizontal hydraulic conductivities will be equal. There's no change in the potential filled with time. Uh, soil and water are incompressible. The flow is laminar. And which makes Darcy's valid, and all boundary conditions are known. And there are three types of boundary conditions. So a no-flow boundary, which would probably be this fault right here. As you can see, nothing is flowing through. Um, that would be a no-flow uh, boundary. Uh, the hydraulic head is the same everywhere, which is called a constant head boundary which is an equal potential line or a groundwater contour, and a water table boundary in uncon unconfined aquifers. Uh, you have recharge or discharge across the water tables. Uh, flow lines will be at an oblique angle to the water table. No recharge, the flow lines are parallel. So these are at about an oblique angle, the start and finish of the flow, the flow paths. So these would be uh, a water table boundary in an unconfined aquifer. As you can see, they are oblique to the water table. So this line right here is the water table designated by this triangle. And if there's no recharge, which would be in the middle of the uh, flow net, uh, obviously that means if the lines are parallel, that means no recharge. So thank you for watching. Um, the next episode will cover groundwater flow to wells. Um, if I remember correctly, that includes cones of depression and hit the like button, subscribe if you are new and hit the bell so you can get notifications on future episodes, later essentials.